and then I go back to to uh, what in Italy, which is awesome. What for two months or so winter retreat. So that's that's gonna that's what I'm doing. Awesome. So now I can have some 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 time with with the technology awesome. and this. <laughs> Cool, yeah, man. It's good to see you again. Uh, I started the recording. Yeah, you uh, too. Did, does anyone mind that I started the recording? Because I, I can, uh, okay. I can turn it off and we can talk off the records if, if anyone wants to do that first. But just because we have a good group here, I'm just gonna start it right away. Um, all right, all right. Yeah. So welcome everybody who's joined. Uh, we have, we have some new members. Uh, that joined from another sangha, um, another uh, group, uh, Urza, Ezra, and Ben. So welcome to them. And uh, we have DJ Jesus and Pietro, uh, longtime friends and sangha members here. Uh, so it really uh, gladdens my mind to see y'all, and it's good to uh, get together here and and share the Dhamma and practice. And I was just talking about to the newcomers that. It's kind of like an informal hangout. Um, to structure it, I'll uh, start reading a sutta, and usually that will spur some uh, some insights and some conversations. But anyone is welcome to cut me off or butt in at any moment if they have something they want to share. Some like it's not just me being the guy that everyone's listening to. If anyone else has like wisdom that they feel called to share please feel free to like speak your wisdom. Um, so it's it's like open for that. Or if you have questions for me or anyone else here, go ahead. Um, or if you just want to share something about your practice. But the sutta I picked out for today um, is one that's very uh, near and dear to me. And I think quite practical and important. It's from the Majjhima Nikaya and it's it's only the fourth one, so it's the fourth one in the book, uh, and it's it's titled Fear and Dread. Right, so fear and dread, the feeling of fear and anxiety and dread. This is one of the main obstacles um, to practice, to to good satisfying practice, right? Where we have been taught and conditioned and uh, we have learned to be afraid, right? So our body has learned to activate um, its fight or flight response um, for no good reason a lot of the times, right? We could be sitting here in a room completely safe, but there might be a sense of unease or fear present, right? And uh, the chances are, is that fear is going to be present if you're not in jhana or if you're in any kinds of uh, defilement or unwholesome state that fear is going to be there no matter what person you are you could be a macho man you could be anyone hey pietro good to see your face <laughs> you could be a macho man you could be anyone there's always that underlining underlying fear which is uh, one of the main uh, hindrances uh, that um has to be intentionally overcome uh but there's a way to intentionally overcome fear so that's the good news um okay so i'll just get right into it reading this sutta take a sip of water um Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at Savati in Jetta's Grove, Anatta Pindaka's Park. Then the Brahmin, John, I'm not even going to try to pronounce that, went to the Blessed One and exchanged greetings with him. When this courteous and amiable talk was finished, he sat down at one side and said, Master Gotama, when clansmen have gone forth from home life into homelessness, out of faith in Master Gotama. Do they have Master Gotama for their leader, their helper, their guide? And do these people follow the example of Master Gotama? This is so, Brahman, 
that is so. When clansmen have gone forth from the home life into homelessness, out of faith in me, they have they have me for their leader, their helper, and their guide, and these people follow my example. But Master Gotama, remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice. Right, so I think anyone who's tried this have, has realized this. It's hard to be alone with your thoughts all by yourself. Go into meditation and those those sankaras will come up, right? It's hard to endure. This is the reality of meditation. Um, and it is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. That is so, Brahman, that is so. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. Seclusion is hard to practice. And it is hard to enjoy solitude. One would think the jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. All right, so important if. If there's no training of your mind, you're going to lose your mind uh, if you're in solitude. Right. So this is why it's important to, to train the mind. Um, before my enlightenment, while I was still only an unenlightened bodhisattva, I too considered thus. Remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest are hard to endure. The jungles must rob a bhikkhu of his mind if he has no concentration. I considered thus, whenever recluses or brahmins unpurified in bodily conduct resort to remote jungle thicket resting places, then owing to the defect of their unpurified bodily conduct, these good recluses and bra brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread. Um, so like the idea is that um, the fear comes up as a habit of instinct, instinctual patterns. So the habits of our mind that have gone on and like been trained uh, through ignorance and uh, before you started practicing meditation will continue uh, when you actually get into seclusion and attempt to uh, practice meditation. Um, But I do not resort to remote jungle thicket rest resting places in the forest, unpurified in bodily conduct. I'm purified in bodily conduct. I resort to remote jung jungle thicket resting places in the forest as one of the noble ones with bodily conduct purified. So this is important. So it's important to come uh, into your meditation with the right attitude and right mindset. Right, so you're entering the meditation with the idea of being noble. So you're you're on a courageous endeavor to surmount suffering, right? You're doing it for the happiness and welfare of everybody. And uh, this this uh, mindset is going to um, affect the course of your meditation. If you come into the meditation with the wrong mindset, so the mindset of being afraid and being a victim, then that will uh, lead to those kinds of mental spirals that will just uh, um, snowball affect the fear, right? People are afraid of fear, right? They're, they're afraid, people have anxiety of anxiety. So if we if we if we if we um, face the fear, we face the fear with the idea that we're noble and we're conquering this fear, and we look at the fear, and just be okay with it as it is, okay with it that it's there. In other words, being fearless of fear, even while it's present, this is the way for uh, the fear to be um, quickly surmounted, right? Um, but it's going to get into that. So it's the this fear is not like um, 
not experienced by people who are uh, sincere practitioners. The Buddha experienced the same fear before he was enlightened. But um, seeing in myself this purity of bodily conduct, I found great solace in dwelling in the forest. So you see the nobility of what you're doing. You see the purity of the meditation. And um, you will find great like joy in, in the solitude, in like in the path that you're going down. There's kind of like a, a courageousness, um, an inspiration that's brought up that, that lets you uh, go through any, any type of fear or darkness. So like, um, as I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Right. So as I sit in the forest alone, I fear nothing. And you just go into it with that mindset. Whatever sensations come up in your body, okay, just look at it. It's what it is. Be not afraid. Be not afraid is the most repeated uh, line in the Bible. <laughs> <laughs> Be not afraid. I wonder why it's the most repeated. Okay, but before I continue, I drink a lot of water, so I have to I have to go pee really quick. But I'm gonna be right back. Oh. All right. Um, feel free to <laughs> chat while I'm gone. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Also, DJ has been quite a while, but. Uh... <laughs> Yeah, it's been a little bit, but yeah, no, glad to see you. How's it going? Well. Fun. <laughs> it's nice to enjoy some sutta time with Scott. Yeah. Yeah. Are you being busy? Sorry. Are you been busy lately, no? Oh yeah, I've started this new school, but uh, like uh, actually when uh, before the call started, I was uh, meditating in my bed. So I was uh, already in the mood. And then I remember that uh, we were uh, having the call soon. And so I said, OK, perfect. <laughs> Wonderful. Mm -hmm. Thanks for coming, man. Okay, I'll just pick up where I left off there. Um, so I found great solace in dwelling in the forest, right? Man, it feels good to get away from it all, right? Just being alone. There's no disturbances. There's nobody to bother you. Nothing to worry about. The only, the only enemy then becomes your own mind, right? The only fear that's created are mental fears when you're alone. So we'll learn how to deal with these mental fears. So I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins unpurified in verbal conduct, unpurified in mental conduct, unpurified in livelihood, resort to remote jungle thicket resting places, they evoke unwholesome fear and dread. But I am purified in livelihood. I resort to remote jungle thickets and resting places. In the forest as one of noble ones with livelihood purified. And this is not to uh, bring about any kind of guilt trip, right? But the idea is that not whether you're purified in livelihood in the deep dark past, but whether you're purified in livelihood right now is what's more important, right? Are you authentically and sincerely trying to uh, come out of suffering here and now? And if the answer is yes, then you're purified in livelihood, right? The past is gone. No point in guilting yourself over any past action. So seeing in myself this purity of livelihood, 
So finding that purity within yourself, that innocence, uh, you find great solace in dwelling in the forest. I considered thus, whenever recluses and Brahman who are covetous and full of lust, I am uncovetous. With a mind of ill will, intentions of hate, I have a mind of loving kindness. Overcome by sloth and tor torpor, I am without sloth and torpor. Overcome with restlessness and unpeaceful mind, I have a peaceful mind. Uncertain and doubt doubting, I have gone beyond doubt. Given to self-praise and disparagement of others, I am not given to self-praise and disparagement of others. Subject to alarm and terror, I am free from trepidation. Desirous of gain and honor and renown, I have few wishes. Lazy and wanting in energy, I am energetic. Unmindful and not fully aware, I am established in mindfulness. Unconcentrated and with straying minds, I am possessed of concentration. I considered thus, whenever recluses or Brahmins devoid of wisdom, drivelers, resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, then owing to the defect of their being devoid of wisdom and drivelers, these good recluses and Brahmins evoke unwholesome fear and dread, but I do not resort to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest devoid of wisdom, a driveler. I am possessed of wisdom. I resort to remote jungle thicket resting places as one of the noble ones possessed of wisdom. Seeing in myself this possession of wisdom, I find great solace dwelling in the forest. So seeing within your own self, your own wisdom, right? Not somebody else's wisdom not an outer wisdom of a deity no the own wisdom of yourself the wisdom you had to even want to meditate in the first place that's your own wisdom and if you direct the mind towards this this wisdom it grows so whatever you feed your attention grows right so if if you feed your attention to um, doubt, the doubt will grow. If you feed your attention to uh, ill will, intentions of hate, that will grow. If you feed your attention to, oh, I'm so tired, you'll just feel more tired, right? So this is a skill of directing our minds. Um, here, I'm going to skip a little bit. Okay, so when he goes into seclusion, uh, I thought, what now if this fear and dread coming? I thought, why do I dwell always expecting fear and dread? What if I subdue that fear and dread while keeping that same posture that I am in when it comes up? So this is where the practice happens. So how come this cycle keeps repeating? That's the question we're asking. What now if this fear and dread is coming? Why do you always expect this fear, right? It's a pattern, you know? We've come to identify with it. We see ourselves as the fear. But why? You know, let's 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 investigate uh, the root of the problem here. What if I subdue that fear while keeping the same posture than I am in when it comes upon me? While I walked, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither stood nor sat nor lay down till I had subdued that fear and dread. While I stood, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor lay down till I have subdued that fear and dread. While I sat, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor lay down till I have subdued that fear and dread. While I lay down, the fear and dread came upon me. I neither walked nor stood nor sat down till I had subdued that fear and dread. Right. So instead of doing what the fear and dread wants us to do, right, instead of trying to find um, 
trying to find some relief uh, in the fear and dread with some sort of distraction, right? We sit there until we subdue it completely. I'm not going to do anything else until I get rid of this fear and dread, right? So this is a pattern breaking. So the pattern of fear will come up and the normal response to that pattern is uh, more hindrances, right? More fear of the fear. Trying to trying to find an escape uh, from the fear in some sort of sensual sensual gratification, right? Maybe you go to the fridge, try to eat something. But the the instruction here is to no, just sit sit with the fear, and just face it. Face it until it goes away. Don't do take your stand. Don't do anything else until the fear subsides. And repeatedly do that every time it comes up. You can ask yourself questions. What is there really to be afraid of? What now in this moment is there to be afraid of? There may be a bodily sensation of sort of of tension. So fear, fear always just comes in the form of a bodily tension. And we can we can be afraid of this sensation. Or we can take our stand and see it for what it is. And even play around with it a little bit. So you can look directly at the tension, whatever tension there may be in your body. And you'll find uh, once you're no longer afraid of the sphere, it will uh, spontaneously vanish on its own accord. Right. So all fear is impermanent. There's no such thing as a permanent fear. Every sensory phenomena is always appearing and disappearing. The only reason it continues is by perpetuating it with your own mind. So if you bring an end to the perpetuation of fear with the activity of your own mind, this, um, this density, this fear will evaporate. It can't stand the heat of mindfulness All right it's like a block of ice and the awareness the mindfulness is like the sun shining down on it it can, it can the the ice block can last a long a long time in the shade during the night during ignorance during unmindfulness when you're not paying attention to your body when you're not paying attention to what's going on this this ice block can last a very long time because the temperatures are right but it cannot withstand the heat of mindfulness the heat of your own, the direction of your own awareness it cannot stand the heat of your own attitude of being a noble practitioner of the dhamma and looking fearlessly at your own experience This ice block will start to melt and it will start to evaporate and it will turn into gas and clouds that vanish in the sky. So 
So um, you can experientially taste the relief of emptiness of the ice block. Even while it's an ice block, it's still empty. It's just it's just a it's just the current form that the water has taken, right? Ice, like all forms of water, ice, um, vapor, and liquid, it's all the same water. It's just different frequency of water, different density, right? Different energy level. So the sensations, the sensations of fear and the sensations of tension can literally be out alchemized. Um, you can perform alchemy uh, to transform this same tension into literal uh, PT and Sukha. The, the energy of fear can be experienced as feeling alive, right? You got the heart rate going, you feel alive. Why do people jump out of airplanes? Right? Because they want to feel alive. It's the same adrenaline. It's the same fear. But instead of uh, being averse to it, you're like, yippee, this is fun. There's really no difference. Except for the relaxation of the body. We. Right. Life is like a whole life is like a roller coaster. Some of us are like freaking out and and crying the whole time and some of us have our hands up and going we and enjoying the ride right so you decide whether you're going to be um clenched up or with your hands up in the air so so whatever posture he was in he didn't change the posture until he subdued that fear and dread. There are Brahmins, some recluses and Brahmins who perceive day when it is night and night when it is day. All right, so perceive day when it is night, night when it is day. So not looking at things clearly, not looking at things rationally. making up excuses, making up stories in our mind for the fear, making up stories. So uh, coming up with all sorts of delusions that sort of uh, mask the real problem. I say on their part, this is an abiding and delusion. When I perceive, but I perceive night when it is night and day when it is day. Right, so understanding dukkha as dukkha and happiness as happiness, dukkha naroda as dukkha naroda. Understanding ignorance as ignorance and wisdom as wisdom. So being honest with the state you're in. Rightly speaking, were it to be said of anyone, a being not subject to delusion has appeared in the world for the welfare and happiness of many. Out of compassion for the world, for the good welfare and happiness of gods and humans. It is me indeed that rightly speaking, this should be said. Right, so now it's going to get into the classic description of jhana. So if you if you sit and you conquer this fear, you know, for the welfare and happiness of, of all beings in the universe, right? You have you have that kind of attitude. You arouse that kind of like gusto, right? You arouse that courageousness. Um, you will get into jhana, and uh, the the description follows suit. Tireless energy was aroused in me. Unremitting mindfulness was established. My body was tranquil and untroubled. My mind concentrated and unified. So energy is aroused. Unremitting mindfulness was established. 
and your body is relaxed and tranquil and untroubled and your mind comes to a state of collectedness of unification you just your experience of reality becomes more um more ordered less chaotic you experience things one by one as they occur each breath one by one when there's not a there when there's not a fear present when you surmount your own fear the simplicity of this moment moment by moment becomes delicious Each, each breath is like a kiss from the universe, a sweet fragrance. And your body um, and your field of experience can become uh, suffused with the perfume of peace. spread out so when you you smell a sweet fragrance for example where do you experience that sweetness so there may be some parts of our experience that are still tense but that's not interesting to us anymore. What's interesting to us is the parts of our experience that is experiencing that sweetness and that relief. So you begin to uh, bring the mind towards uh, the experience of relief and sweetness. And, and, uh, and feed it your attention. And the bitterness will join the party. There's no bitterness that can't be transformed into sweetness. Quite secluded from sensual pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, I entered upon and abided in the first jhana, which is accompanied by applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. All right, so we get into the state where we're having one thought after another about the Dhamma. Every thought is Dhamma. Everything is okay. There's nothing to worry about. Every this body, this life, all of it is impermanent. There's nothing there's none of it that's worth worrying about or clinging to. And there's no reason to be afraid.
before I continue, is there any questions or any comments? Anything anyone like to talk about? I think we're having a good time. Wonderful. <laughs> okay. Great. It's very difficult to talk with this. There's really nothing. The that's the thing is that um, the actual practice is kind of like a conversation ender. All right. Because the, the joy and the peace is more interesting than the thoughts. Yeah. So that, that's it's where very we difficult to talk. All right. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's very, it's very nice as you, how you, how you speak it and everything. It's very nice. Thank you. It's, it's like, a... yeah, yeah. It's just I'm trying to explain like how to do it, but it's like you can't really explain how to do it. But um, the transition from first to second jhana is when those thoughts start to subside and you're just a happy camper and you don't even need to think about it anymore so quite secluded from uh with the stilling of the applied and sustained thought i entered upon and abided in the second jhana which has self-confidence and singleness of mind without applied and sustained thought with rapture and pleasure born of seclusion. All right, so this is the this is the state that uh, you get into when you're just soaking it all in. And you don't even need to think about it. You found a safe place to rest. And the mind can finally uh, relax and take a break from trying to figure figure it out, trying to get something. With the fading away as well of rapture, I abided in equanimity and mindful and fully aware, still feeling pleasure with the body. I entered upon and abided in the third jhana on account of which noble ones announced he has a pleasant abiding who has equanimity and is mindful. Right. So even just sitting with, with a smile on your face, can evoke uh, jhana. Just sitting here, just just a little smile, you know. Um, humor is also a good vehicle. It's it's kind of funny. That we're taking things so seriously and being afraid about things or even wanting uh, certain sensations to go away without realizing it's just a sensation. It's not going to bite you. Any bodily sensation you have, like what harm does it really do to you? It comes and it goes.
with abandoning of pleasure and pain and with the previous disappearance of joy and grief, I entered upon and abided in the fourth jhana, which has neither pain nor pleasure and purity of mindfulness due to equanimity. When my concentration, when my concentrated mind was purified thus, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability. So there's kind of a bright uh, quality of mind uh, that's malleable and wieldy, right? So your 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 hard and fast rules, your hard and fast ideas of self, and your hard and fast preconceptions of things become a little bit more malleable, you know, a little bit more fluid. You stop thinking of things in black and white. You stop thinking of things as as um, the story of me, right? The mind becomes malleable, wieldy. Anything's possible in our field of experience. Um, and then he like recollects past lives and has like past life experience and all that. Just gonna skip that part. <laughs> and then uh, the uh, eventually the um the jhana um evolves into uh fruition um ignorance was banished and true knowledge arose darkness was banished and light arose as happens in one who is abides diligent ardent and resolute when my concentrated mind was purified, bright, unblemished, rid of imperfection, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, I directed it to knowledge of the destruction of the taints. I, direct, I directly knew as it actually is, this is suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. I directly knew as it actually is, these are the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the origin of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the cessation of the taints. I directly knew as it actually is, this is the way leading to the cessation of the taints. When I knew and saw thus, my mind was liberated from the taint of sensual desire, from the taint of being, from the taint of ignorance. When it was liberated, there came the knowledge, it is liberated. I directly knew, birth is destroyed. The holy life has been lived. What was needed to be done has been done. There is no more coming into any state of being. This was the third true knowledge attained by me in the last watch of the night. Ignorance was banished, true knowledge arose, darkness was banished and light arose, as happens in one who's diligent, ardent and resolute. Now, Brahman, you might think, perhaps the recluse Gotama is not free from lust, hate and delusion even today, which is why he resorts to remote jungle thicket resting places in the forest, but you should not think thus. It is because I see two benefits that I still resort to remote jungle thicket resting places. I see a pleasant abiding for myself here and now, and I have compassion for future generations. Indeed, it is because Master Gotama is accomplished, uh, fully enlightened, that he has compassion for future generations, Magnus Magnificent, Master Gotama, magnificent. Master Gotama has made the Dhamma clear in many ways, as though he were turning upright what had been overthrown, revealing what was hidden, showing the way to one who was lost, or holding up a lamp in the darkness for those with eyesight to see forms. I go to Master Gotama for refuge and to the Dhamma and the Sangha of Bhikkhus, from today, remember me as a lay follower who has gone to him for refuge for life. All right. 
That's powerful. There's a way, the way, the truth, and the life out of suffering. And it's all up to your own, it's all up to your own mind and where you direct it. And it takes courage, man. It takes courage to face the fear, to face the sankaras. But the more you do it, the more enjoyable it becomes. And like, and when it becomes enjoyable, you keep doing it because it's enjoyable. So it doesn't mean that, oh, what you become enlightened, then you don't need to practice meditation anymore, right? If you have success. No, you, you practice meditation because you enjoy it. It's enjoyable to do. Why would you stop, right? You found a happiness that's not dependent on anything else. And that's rare. To find happiness that's not dependent on the world, you become free of the world and you become... You're like a free man before you're a, you're a slave you're a slave to the world and you're a slave to what people telling you you need to be what societal constructs of what a happy person is or what a successful person is or what what you need to have you need to have the wife and the and the three car garage and the and the picket fence right but these people if you look at them some of them are happy if they practice um, but a lot of them are miserable. So you'll see that that's not the answer either. But if you find the answer to happiness, you'll end up losing interest in everything else that you believed would make you happy. And you walk around with a confidence that exudes that peace and tranquility. And it, it's kind of confusing to people. Like, what does that guy have that I don't have? Right? Why is he happy? And it may even make people um, angry with you or subconsciously jealous or upset with you. Mm. And they may even want to poop your party and try mm. to poke your buttons a little bit. And you can see the comedy in that. Right. No, that's OK. I'll just go. You can go go if if you can keep your butt hurtness. No, thanks. If you don't take it, then it, a gift not received is kept by the by the gift giver. Right. You don't take people's bullshit. Yeah, it's very liberating to realize that, wait, we don't have to pick that up. <laughs> you don't have to pick that up. And you, you are com in complete power and control of your own happiness. No, I, I, I don't need people to give me attention to be happy. Okay. I got it all like within myself. Everything I need. You're already... Um, Something uh, a teacher of teacher of a teacher of an Advaita teacher said, that's pretty Dhamma. Um, he said, uh, you're already fully equipped for happiness. You've got everything you need. There's nothing external that is needed for happiness. You're already fully equipped. If you're alive, you have the capacity for happiness. Happiness is just the purity of being alive without desire for something else other than just that joy of being alive. That, wow, we can really revel in it. Like, I'm alive right now. It's a miracle. I made it this far without dying, right? <laughs> As Don Rado always says. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations, man. We're here. We're alive. <laughs> Woohoo, I'm still breathing. <laughs> there's no other accomplishment that you need or there's no other there's no purpose to life besides being alive itself. We've arrived. This is it. This is the purpose. 
here we are. Yeah, thank you, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Experience that joy. Congratulations. That, yeah. <laughs> experience that joy that you have total access to that somebody may think they need to win the Super Bowl to experience. <laughs> Winning the Super Bowl. Yeah. I, I, we did it. The fucking confetti popping the champagne bottles, right? Yeah. You can experience that joy and happiness because you won the, the cosmic Super Bowl of being alive. <laughs> Here we are. <laughs> That's why the the translation of the blessed one really just means like the lucky one. Like if you stumbled upon this dhamma, consider yourself lucky. You know what I mean? Like so like think of yourself so as just lucky gratitude right just being grateful that how lucky i am beautiful uh, it's beautiful this feeling of gratefulness it's beautiful and like like uh that's why i like that's why i'm into like uh i also appreciate like christian mysticism and stuff like that or like anyone who practices just like the awe, like awe inspiring gratitude for like God and like God the presence of God and God's creation or seeing that that God is sending a hundred messages every moment like every moment is my mantra every every experience every sensation is the angels trumpeting out the victory of God. Wow. Right. So like you can get poetic with it. Like, like just really how good can I feel? <laughs> All right, brothers. If, if there's anything else uh, anyone wants to continue, I'm welcome to keep going. Actually, I, I wanted to share that it's very timely, the fear and dread subject, because I've been in, in, in trouble with fear not long ago. I fear, I feel, I feel that, well, Virtue. I mean, I remember. I remember virtue and taking refuge in the in the noble friends, being very powerful for for this fear. In virtue, for example, like I remember, like I mean, bugs or birds or spiders around me, they were not in danger because I was not gonna harm them. Then I felt like I was not in danger either. You know, it was very helpful and. Um, and then the Mahato told me, I remember you have noble friends. It's like, all right, yeah, that's true. Why I, I forget something like that, you know? Remember so, you have what? Yeah. I'm sorry, I didn't. Remember you have what, he said? Like noble friends. Like, right. Don't forget you have, you have noble, noble friends. friends. Like, okay. Yeah. Remember the noble Sangha. Yeah. Yeah, like remember your buddies. Yeah, like, that was like. Actually, yeah, if you just... that was like a kind of refuge. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah, it is a refuge to just be grateful for each other. Like, remember your your noble um, brothers that that we have here. Um, we all wishing each other well. We all wishing each other happiness. You know, like remember, like we're we're all in this. We're all in this together. Like we're on the same the same um, goal to to come out of suffering and just be happy. Yeah. So you have that entire support. This thing is much bigger than just you. You have the entire momentum of the of the Buddha himself, the Dhamma and the Sangha perpetuating. It's like an unstoppable force of nature. It's a it's a hurricane that will take you over. Right. <laughs> it's it's an infectious disease that there's no cure for it. And it will infect your mind. And eventually it will become terminal and there's no going back. (laughs) 
All right, friends. Good to, good to have you, brothers. Thank you very much. I, I really do love you yeah. guys. I love you guys so much. Honestly, thanks for coming. <laughs> you, me too. It's yeah, and it's good to much. like that we have like uh, we we've been friends for a while now. It's good to like keep seeing you guys, and we're still friends. It's really beautiful. Yeah. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> bye, Pietro. Good to see you, brother. Bye, bye, everybody. Thank bye. you, Scott. Bye, Jesus. Bye, DJ. See you guys. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.